successes in the United States and the UK, as well as in Canada, Brad Fraser's plays helped redefine the Canadian dramatic character, proving that we could be as impolite and fucked up as Americans or Brits or anyone else. <laughs> I, I like to think that that's that, that, um, what uh, plays like Unidentified Human Remains and The True Nature of Love did for, uh, for Canadian theater, because uh, it, a Canadian theater has always been relative, I think, to American and, and uh, continental theater, kind of uh, polite. You're not polite at all. No, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a line uh, in Unidentified Human Remains um, spoken by David McMillan, who uh, I've always thought is kind of your persona, because he shows up in a number of plays after Unidentified Human Remains. He's literally standing on a ledge, and he says, if it's not scary, it's not worth doing. And I wondered if that might be kind of the motto of your playwriting uh, credo? That's my, the motto of my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you approach playwriting? Like, uh, where, you know, where do these ideas come from? Why play, and why, why plays? Um, plays, because, uh, you know, and I can say this now, I mean, plays originally because you could get produced uh, a lot easier than you could get a television show or uh, uh, movie produced, particularly in those days, which are the late 70s in Edmonton, Alberta, and theaters are just getting a lot of money because we've got oil and everybody's interested in culture and Stephen Heatley's there and Kelly <laughs> Derrick is there. And there's this very uh, kind of uh, fertile landscape in Edmonton at the time of people who were hungry to tell their stories and to not, to, to not see any more fucking plays from England, you know, to not see any more off-Broadway hits being brought in, but to say, how do we do that, and, and wh where do we go with it? And, you know, I come in as a, a, a you know, Métis kid from poverty who grew up with a background of abuse and a lot to say, who went, you know, if all these middle-class old white people weren't doing this, it would be a lot better. And so a lot of my, uh, my original impulse to write plays came from wanting to speak against what I was seeing all the time and to offer something kind of different. And it just kind of snowballed from there. I mean, I won the Alberta Culture Playwriting Award twice, uh, once when I was in high school and then the next year. And I went to Banff and was in the Banff Colony for a month <laughs> with all these Canadian playwrights. <laughs> 1977. <laughs> it was all kitchen sink and coal mining and <laughs> something with a cow and that was <laughs> boring bullshit I'd ever read and never been exposed to in my life. And I went, you know, that we need something else there. They need someone like me who will come in and tell them all to fuck off and, and, and go with it. So, but what I've learned since then, I worked a lot in film and television and various other uh, uh, media, is that theater is the most immediate thing, the most immediate way of communicating that I can think of. I mean, when you write a TV show, you have to get the money for the TV show, you have to get the actors, you have to build the sets, all of that with the movie too. And, you know, when I write a play, and if I write a scene where it says, uh, you know, scene one, where an undersea city called Atlantis and everybody is swimming around, and, you know, we have to build that for TV and film, but in theater you give them a green light and you say, hey, we're in Atlantis and we're all swimming around. <laughs> There. And then in scene two, you're in a pearlescent city on the moon full of moon people, and we don't have to build the moon people or the moon. We could just say that and change the light and tell the actors, okay, now you're moon people. And everybody buys into it because it, it, it requires you to use your imagination and you participate. And so the reason I keep coming back to the theater is for that immediacy that I think um, affects people in a very different way than the electronic media does. And I think the power of that is something that's always changing and something that's always growing and it's something that I've never ever tired of exploring. So that's why I keep coming back to plays, if it answers your question. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was thinking about the cows and, and uh, <laughs> just going back to un unidentified human remains because it was such a, it was such a, sh it was such a shock and I think a, a, a kind of wake up a call in, in the early 90s that, that, you know, a Canadian play set in Edmonton about a serial killer. Yeah. Um, that's not something we've seen before. No, especially with a gay protagonist. Yeah. Well, he wasn't dying of AIDS or coming well, out. Well, that's right. That's right. <laughs> one, 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 one conversation yeah. in the play about AIDS, I think, and that's it. Yeah, well, not even. It's a couple of lines. A couple of lines. Yeah. yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, it was definitely a different but that You know, that play came from, I did uh, the first uh, playwrights unit at Tarragon with uh, Urjo Correta in 1981 or so, when I first moved to Toronto. And at the end of that process, I went, okay, I have to do something that is the complete opposite of everything I've just been taught. Because the kind of unities I was being told about, the kind of way we were supposed to write a play that had to have one set and not more than five people and nobody should really swear, and I thought, yeah, okay, so I see a lot of those plays, and, and they're kind of boring. So that particular play came out of a reaction against everything else that I was writing in the theater. And when I wrote it, I literally said to myself, I never care if this play gets produced. I cannot write a play hoping it will be produced. I'm going to write this play as I want to write it. And that play is still being produced today, I mean, a lot. I was in... Uh, Brazil three years ago and saw it done in, in Portuguese by a Brazilian theater company that totally deconstructed the entire play and rearranged it and put us in a big, uh, a big art deco office building that the government now owned. And in the beginning, it, the audience was just in the rotunda and the actors came out and started talking and moving about and pulling you in. And the play had begun and you didn't even know. It. And then they led you into a room where you were in the exterior scenes and they were all happening there and it was all leaves and trees and stuff and I was like what the fuck this is amazing this is, you know and it was it, it was so uh, what, reassuring I guess is the word to see that 30 years later other people young writers and actors and directors were taking this work and still doing things with it and still finding it as scary and as exciting as we did 30 years ago when it was happening in Canada yeah. cool um, the, uh, I love the title of this talk. I don't know if you know who gets credit for that. Yes, <laughs> sex, love, and euthanasia. Um, so I thought I thought we should actually hit each of those uh, each of those terms. Um, sex is a big part of all your plays, mm -hmm. including I think every character in this play has sex. Uh, uh, probably the most uh, I like to use the word problematic, but the most. Um, Interesting uh, of the characters is Joey, who is uh, who is uh, physically disabled, and uh, sex for him has a lot of dimensions and is difficult in a lot of different ways. But I I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about why sex. I mean, it sounds like a stupid question. Is <laughs> why is sex so important? I mean, why is sex so? Why is I've sex, never been asked that. Why is sex <laughs> so important? <laughs> As a dramatic, uh, as a dramatic theme, as a dramatic device, as a plot device, as something that your characters are constantly engaged in. If they're not talking about it, they're doing it, or they're complaining, or <laughs> well, it's, looking for it. Uh, I mean, you know, sex is in my work. I think it, it is an extension of of intimacy. It's an extension of self hatred. It's an extension of desire. It's an extension of many things. And I think that we're driven by you know, the need to eat and the need to survive and the need to fuck and that everybody feels those things and that in keeping it out of the theater, there's no way we can talk responsibly or authentically about relationships if we don't talk about sex because sex is going to be part of every relationship even if you're not having it. It's still going to be some kind of drive in there and I, I think that, you know, what I did very early on was I looked at what wasn't represented on the stage because I wasn't represented on the stage and, and I sort of expanded from there and what aren't people talking about, what aren't people dealing with, what are those subjects that nobody is going near because there's lots of plays from people doing all the other stuff. So what is my niche going to be? And my niche is going to be talking about the things other people don't talk about. And, and sex is a very big part of that. And also, um, I mean, I'm a sexual person, but I was also sexually abused as a child. I mean, I had teenage parents where, you know, sex was an obsession for them. Uh, so that world that I grew up in, and, and sex is an obsession for everyone. I mean, you just have to look at the advertising, you know, TV, film, whatever. But I don't want it to be titillating. I don't want it to be uh, something that's there uh, gratuitously. I want it to be an integral part of my characters and my story and why it's going on so that it isn't just something that's grafted on to keep people sort of interested, but something that asks really hard questions about who we are sexually and why we do the things we do sexually and why we're driven to do the things we do, perhaps, by sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a wonderful, I think, uh, <clears throat> line from one of the reviews of, uh, of the London production um, 
Fraser has a quirky, revealing take on humanity in all its colors and variety that isn't often theatricalized. I thought that was a really good, mm -hmm. uh, really uh, kind of nailed uh, what you're doing in this in this play. Um, one of the scenes that uh, that everybody seems seems to talk about, uh, or one of the uh, things alert. that happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, is that uh, yeah, this is kind of a spoiler alert, I guess. Um, although it, it, it kind of happens early on, is that this teenage, this physically disabled teenage boy, who, who's just just arrived at puberty, keeps get his father has to bathe him, and he keeps getting hard-ons in the bathtub. And at a certain point, there's a discussion among the responsible adults as to whether he should be relieved in some way or other, and, uh, and the father kind of takes on the responsibility of doing that. Did that come, where did, well, do you want to talk a little bit about came that? Came from the Toronto Star. Came from the Toronto Star, from an ethics column that I read many years ago, in the 90s. It was a, a letter from a father who had a severely disabled son, uh, who also had a mother, but because the son was going through puberty, he was becoming very self-conscious about getting erections and things like that, and didn't want his mother to bathe him anymore. And the father was bathing him, and the father said in the letter, he's made it clear through his nonverbal communication that he would like me to do something about this. And I'm very uncomfortable with this, but I do wipe his ass, I do clean his foreskin, I do touch him in many, many intimate ways that alleviate the problems he has with his condition, is it wrong for me to alleviate that particular need as a, opposed to the other ones? And I thought, now there's an ethical question. <laughs> <laughs> there's an ethical question. And the, and the person answering the question is sort of, uh, yeah, that's a real tough one. <laughs> you know, because what, what else do you say? I mean, say we're talking about something so intimate and so personal and so private uh, within the family that that the idea of it was completely heartbreaking breaking yeah, for me yeah, in the yeah. end for a parent to be in that position so what does that do and I carried that around for many years and I have people with disability in my family and always have I've always known people with various kinds of disability throughout the years and I thought no one ever talks about the sexuality of the disabled. No one talks about the intimacy of the disabled. How do these people find intimacy? And I remember um, when Jamie Portman wrote his review of the production in Ottawa, he talked about um, creeps. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the writer's name? David, David, David Freeman. Freeman. David Freeman, thank you very much. And David Freeman, when he interviewed him, saying, when he said, you know, what do you want out of the life? David Freeman said, I want to have intimate contact of any kind with one other person in my life. That's what I want to have. And, and, and then Jamie talks about how he probably never found that in the course of his life. So that idea of people who are kept from the things we take for granted and experience every day because of an accident of birth um, is, is very powerful and is very important to me. So when I wanted to write this play, I thought, you know, people, and I wrote early drafts and people read them and went, oh my God, this is a play about child abuse. You can't ever do this play and things like that. And it's because, you know, I, it took me seven or eight drafts to kind of get the right tone for yes. that feeling and for that, you know, important scene right in the middle of the play to be able to find that. And that's not the kind of thing you find the first time you write it or even the second time you write it. And also, I spoke to a great many professionals. I spoke to some people who were actually uh, uh, sex workers for the disabled about what it was like from their side and that kind of thing. And my respect for people who do that kind of work grew so immensely because it is the most difficult job in the world. It is absolutely the most difficult job in the world. So I thought, if I'm going to write a play, it has to have that sense of profundity to yes. what's going on here. I think it's handled with great responsibility in the play. The characters discuss it at great length, they talk about various ramifications, they worry that the father is going to be accused of sexually abusing his own son, that social worker is going to come in. Um, and, uh, and then also, I guess, you know, and Roy's in the house too, finding a way to stage mm -hmm. um, those scenes uh, so that they're not prurient uh, right. and, that they may, and, and that they retain the kind of profundity that you're talking about. Which kind of leads me to, to the second point, um, the second point in the title of our talk, which is love. <clears throat> um, you're kind of 
have a reputation as sort of a shit disturber. Mm -hmm. But um, the reviews of this play uh, talk a lot about, they, a couple of words kept coming up. One is compassionate, and the other is loving. <clears throat> and it occurred to me, of course, that Unidentified Human Remains, it, the half of the title is the true nature of love. And uh, I wonder if that isn't, uh, if you could talk a little bit about that as a theme in your work right from the beginning. Well, you know, love is so, uh, the word love is so loaded, it's so multidimensional, it means so many things. And I find very often in life, what we are told is love is the furthest thing from love at all, that it is in fact possession, it is in fact mm -hmm. control, it is in fact a uh, way of saying to people, give me what I'm giving you, or give me more than I'm giving you, and it, it really disturbs me, but it also means uh, something very wonderful, whether it's, it's a, a kind of love between friends, or love between family members, or a love between lovers, between people who are having physical contact, that the, the multi-dimensionality of that word fascinates me, because it, it is when you look at it, I find when I look at it, it is as many negative things as it is positive things. And I think that that's, that's really important and that our idea of love and the use of the word love is often abused. People use it in a very cavalier, very controlling, very uh, selfish fashion quite often. And I like to show the differentiation between what I think of as real love, which is love that's given without asking anything in return. <coughs> and uh, uh, commercial love, which is the kind of love that you use as a barter system or as an exchange with some other person and a, as a way of controlling them. And I've always been fascinated with that. And I've been in many relationships with my, in my life and told that I've been loved by many people who didn't love me at all. And I think that uh, that, that kind of makes you aware of just how nuanced that word can be. And, and for me, everything I write is about love in some way or another. Every play, every everything that I've written is, is at, at its heart is about some kind of love, whether it's a positive love, whether it's a negative love, whether it's a destructive love, whether it's a constructive love, you know, it really varies, but it is at the heart of everything I do. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I mean, reading this play, uh, and in, I'm, I'm familiar with most of, I think most of your work, at least since, since uh, Unidentified Human Remains, <clears throat> and um, I, I, can, I can't quite decide whether this play is an extension of what you're doing in the earlier work or, or something new-er. Um, and uh, uh, I wonder about that, the issue of family. Like in the earlier plays, especially from the gay character's perspective, mm -hmm. these heteronormative families are, are, are not of much use. Um, there isn't much love in them, the right. kind of love you've just been talking about. Um, they're not very functional in your plays. Whereas the characters in this play, in Kill Me Now, actually kind of redesign the family mm -hmm. in, uh, in, a, in, a very, uh, in a very unusual way. It's not you know, mom, dad, and, and the kids. But it turns out to be, in its own way, highly functional and very loving. Talk a little about that notion of family. Well, I think, I, I think any queer person understands that uh, just how delicate the idea of familial love can be, that just how quickly it can be pulled away when uh, you proclaim you are different than the people who love you, and that uh, you know, for a great many queer people, what we have to do is we have to go out and we have to create our own families, and we have to find out who those family members are, and we have to renegotiate the idea of love and familial love, and so I think you're right in that it is both connected to everything I've written before, and it is also brand new, because I had a very bad father. I had a very uh, a physically abusive, mentally abusive, bullying father, and I carry that violence that was um, committed against me as a child and as an adolescent around every day of my life. And it informs, I mean, you say, I'm a shit disturber, you know, when people say you don't like authority, that all stems from that. And my whole journey as a man has been to try to find out how to take that anger and that rejection and turn it into something positive something where I don't lash out at other people or at myself for what was done to me. So for this play, and I've never faced that before, I wanted to create the father I never had. And, and so I wanted a, a play about a boy and his father. And I wanted it to be something different than I'd ever written before. And to do that, I went to places I've never gone before. Yes, it's, a very, it's, a, it's an extraordinary 
an extraordinarily loving relationship. Um, again, I don't want I don't want there to be any spoiler alerts, uh, any more spoiler <coughs> alerts. Um, if you haven't figured out what's going on. <laughs> but the last part, the last part of uh, the last part of the of our title is euthanasia, and um, and of course that's a that's a word that sets off alarms uh, in a lot of quarters. Um, and again, without without uh, giving anything away about where that occurs in the play, I just want to read the, one of the um, comments that I found online about the British production, which um, got rave reviews, the London production. Everyone but the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never liked me. <laughs> yeah, the Independent said it packs all the more powerful and emotional punch for its honesty, taboo-busting humor, and compassion. The stage calls it a compassionate uh, portrait, but, uh, I could go on and on, but, <clears throat> but there is a, uh, there is a uh, kind of um, open letter from someone on a, a website called Disability Arts Online UK, quote, um, watching Kill Me Now, a black comedy about assisted suicide, reminds me that attitudes towards disabled people have changed little since the Nazi slaughter in the <coughs> 1930s. Um, so can you respond to the kinds of, I know, I, and I understand that there was some critical feedback in Winnipeg, uh, is that right? Anyway. Uh, there anyway. have been in every production, so. Yeah. Um, and I can, well, do you want to talk about the, do you want to talk about that and how you uh, um, respond to it? I knew I was setting myself up for that, for this, for this exact kind of criticism in writing the play, and, and that's part of why I wrote the play. I mean, a great deal of what I hear people discussing now is who has the right to tell certain stories, to say certain things, to use certain words. And you know, my question back is, who has the right to tell anybody what they can do with their imagination? Mm -hmm. It seems to me the most fascistic thing that I can imagine. Yeah. But when I started writing the play, I knew the euthanasia was not going to be related to the disabled character. I certainly understand that fear of, of wanting to get rid of the people who are damaged, the people who are different. It's very easy to just dispose of them for you know, the biggest part of the 20th century. We sent them off to institutions where we never had to look at them again and other people uh, took care of them. It's the disabled person who helps the abled person to their death. It's not anybody helping the disabled person. So I don't understand where that criticism comes from, if you've actually watched or read the play. Because it very clearly is not about killing people who are disabled. In fact, it's about uh, how people who are disabled have the ability to actually assist the able-bodied person. And I think that's, that's really important. And I think when I hear comments like that, and there was another big sort of outcry in London from a woman who really felt that the play was, was far too gritty and it should be more like her life with her disabled <laughs> daughter, which was really lovely and they had a nice home. And there was never any conflict. And this woman, I mean, no, she got like hundreds of people going on this thing, which, you know, I'm, I'm really good with just between all of us. Like, I like that kind of controversy and I like that kind of discussion, but what was actually going on, and what's been going on from the beginning of my career, and it's always couched in sort of homophobia and you know all this kind of stuff, it's actually classism. It's actually classism that comes from the people who go to the theater. And a great many of them are very upset that someone from my background and my class can come into the theater and tell my stories and dare to make them uncomfortable. So in terms of, of euthanasia, uh, I'm a gay man who has lived to 59 through the AIDS crisis without getting AIDS, without becoming HIV positive. I know a lot of dead people. I know a lot of people who have helped those people become dead because the life they were living was too horrifying to go on with. So I, I, I respect people who, who have issues with this, but I don't respect people who make the play something it's not and something it never was and was never meant to be and can't be misinterpreted as some kind of cry to get rid of all the disabled people in the world or hurt disabled people because it's not that at all. I do believe very strongly that Every person should have the agency over their own body that if they want to, for whatever reason, to modify their body, to change their adult body, or to end their life, they have the right to do that. 
I believe that very strongly. I don't care what anybody's religion says. If your religion says that can't happen, don't do it, you know? But for anybody else whose religion doesn't say that or whose belief system doesn't say that, then that is our right. And if I was in a position, I mean, I had spinal stenosis for five years. I could not literally walk a block. It would take me 35 minutes to get from Church Street to Young Street, and I would be in tears and agony every step of the way. And I reached a point where I said, if this is going to be my life, I don't want it. I don't want it. And it's not one of those things where if you have spinal stenosis that you're going to die of it. It's not going to kill you. It's just going to keep you in pain and agony. I mean, it's different for everybody and it comes in varying degrees depending where it is in the body. But I very seriously looked at it and said, if this is going to be the rest of my life, then I don't want the rest of my life to be like this. And if I want to make that decision, I'll make that decision. And it's nobody else's fucking business what I do with it. You know? So... I'm not up for killing people. I, I really don't like you know people killing each other for any reason. But I think when um, when there are you know extenuating circumstances, that sometimes it is a valid decision. And I'm sure there. Were, well, I know that there was some blowback about the character of Joey and about the fact that in at least in London, he was played by an able-bodied actor, and there was some talk about how it should have been an actor with some physical disability. Mm -hmm. And did you also get um, criticism uh, based on the notion that you were writing about a world that was not yours and so you weren't, you should not have been writing about disabled characters? I did, but you know what, the whole fucking world is mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's all mine. It's all yours. Anything we see, anything we hear, anything we experience, anything we eavesdrop on, it is ours. That's called life. That's the stimulation. That's where we get ideas from. That's what keeps us thinking. That's what keeps us feeling. So nobody gets to tell me what I write about. I was gonna, I was just, Nazis do that. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I was going to read from, and I will, I'll read from uh, this uh, essay that you've written that uh, kind of prefaces the play called On Characters and Casting. And the second paragraph says, I'm a writer, I tell the stories of these people, outsider stories, our stories. Not once did it occur to me to ask if I had a right to portray these people. Portraying people is what writers do. I chose to write for the theater, not only because of my love of the form, but because it's always been the place where those who live on the margins of society are first able to share and find their voice. So that, is that your, again, your uh, kind of manifesto in regard yeah, to that? I wrote it. Yeah. Right there. Not as introductions and plays, they know. Um, so, so uh, actually, I want to ask, ask Roy, Roy this question. So you, you actually cast in this production uh, the, the character of Joey, a, an actor who has, I understand, uh, cerebral palsy? Yeah, I did. Uh, I, I fell in love with this play when I read it, and I um, really, I, I read it when I was still at the Centaur in Montreal, but, and I knew I was, when I found out I was coming back to Touchstone, I thought, wow, what a... This is the perfect touchstone play. It's got a great big heart. It's edgy. It's got uh, controversial issues. It's Brad. Brad has a history. This is the fourth production. Uh, I'd say every 10 or 20 years, right? When <laughs> and, uh, get together and play. But I did feel that it would be really important to, um, in an in effort to be inclusive, to work with a, an artist with a disability to play the role if we could find one. And, and I don't know, Brad, you could probably tell us. Uh, I know that I, I did get to see the production that was done in Winnipeg in Ottawa mm -hmm. after I'd already decided I wanted to do the play. But Sarah's family did a great show with an actor who lives with cerebral palsy and is actually much m more physically disabled than the actor uh, Adam, Warren, Adam Grant Warren, who I've cast, who has cerebral palsy but is pretty high functioning. He operates in a wheelchair. He doesn't. He functions in a wheelchair, but he's uh, he doesn't have impeded speech, and he doesn't have um, he's got full use of his arms, etc. Uh, but he is in a wheelchair, and he doesn't work in a motorized wheelchair. His learning to drive has been probably the hardest thing to rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> Crashing into the tub, not not really, just knocking over a props table. But um, uh, but it was really important to me that if we were going to do this play, I wanted to make sure we could do that. I just I didn't like the idea of the thought of getting a wonderful young Studio 58 grad, able-bodied actor to do this role right now. I felt like um, 
I agree with Brad. I think he has right, and you have you, you have connections, and as you said, in in your life and in your family to uh, create the integrity of the character. Uh, but but I don't need that. You don't. I don't need actually that. need that. No, but in it, order to be able to write this play. No, but I think it's sort of it, it, it's why the play is as beautiful and rich as it is. But that's about authenticity, yes. right? And authenticity doesn't necessarily come from. Uh, having first-hand experience with, say, someone you're writing about. Authenticity can come from a lot of good research, a lot of hard work. I mean, a lot of reworking. As I said, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the early drafts didn't work and people had real problems with them and I had to keep pushing myself to do that. And I really resent this idea that everybody who writes a play about something that's, or a book or whatever, about something who's, somebody who's not like them, that doesn't work is doing something evil. Because in fact, everything we do the first time or two doesn't work, right? It, it, the intent is really important. And it takes people, it takes artists a long time to get things right. Every actor doesn't play the perfect Hamlet the first time they play it. It takes them seven or eight Hamlets before they get really good at it. But we don't say, oh my God, you can never do Hamlet again. We believe that you have the ability to get better and to, to work harder. I mean, I work with young actors all, or young writers all the time who are trying to write about things way beyond their reach. I mean, you know, things that do not really exist in their world. And the first thing I say to them is get out there and get into that world. Don't sit back and look at it. Go and live in it. Go and do the research. Go and find these people. Go and talk to them because that's more important for me uh, than, than uh, a writer who's writing about their mom because she was an alcoholic, so now I'm writing a play about an alcoholic or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But the research, the work we do is really important. And when it comes to casting, um, I have never, you know, people call me up and say, oh, can we do Stanley <coughs> Fridge in, in, can we read it in Regina, but we don't have any black actors, could we use an East Asian actor? Would that, you know, would that bother you? I'm, do whatever you want. They're actors. I mean, you have what you have. I mean, Thompson Highway is the one who says, quit trying to put all of these native actors into my plays and insisting they all have to be native because they never get done. <laughs> and I would rather see them done than whatever that kind of authentic authenticity is that demands that you, know, you have to be whatever it is. And I, I fully support the right of a disabled actor to play any role, in fact, that they can play in the same way I fully uh, support the right for an able-bodied actor to play any role they can play as well. But being the thing doesn't necessarily make you the best actor to play the role. You know, I mean, I'm gay, but I'm really not good at playing gay characters because I'm not a very good actor. <laughs> so, you know, you don't have to say, hey, you're gay, come on, come and do this part. You know, that, that we, the thing I want to see is I want to see the people out there auditioning, whether they're disabled, whatever that disability is. And again, I have people who, actors who come in, I was doing a show uh, a couple of years ago written by a young writer named Gijo Kaysen that was set in Africa, and, and I had a, a deaf actor come out and she wanted to read for it, and I said, absolutely. And she read, and you know, I said, this is, you know, you've got tons of potential, there's all kinds of things going on, but this play is, is about people speaking to one another, that the, the writer wants to hear their language, and I don't think this is the appropriate part for you to be in, but I would certainly put you in something else. You know, but the idea that, um, that we restrict casting is every bit as offensive to me as the idea that we have to put our able-bodied friends who are white in all the roles as well. You know, they're both difficult. And then there are, are practical concerns, and I'm not going to be ashamed of the fact that if I'm a director and I want this, 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 and that scene's got to happen and this has got to go over there and you've got to be able to do that, then people have to physically be able to do that. That being said, I know a great many able-bodied actors who are not capable of doing that. <laughs> you know, well, they will never get the this, this, this. So it doesn't really have anything to do with what's going on here, it has everything to do with, with what's going on here. I think it's really interesting that uh, uh, in the play, Joey's friend Rowdy, who's played by Brayden, who's here, uh, who is my favorite character, um, <laughs> is, uh, has fetal alcohol syndrome. And no one actually, as far as I can see, has ever said, this should be played by an actor with fetal alcohol syndrome. <laughs> like, that would be hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> they're all played by actors. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not feel, but certainly <laughs> in adolescent <laughs> alcohol syndrome. Um, I, 
we would like to give uh, everybody a chance to speak to Brad, to ask him questions, to challenge him, to uh, compliment him. So um, would anybody like to ask a question? Don't be shy. Yeah? You wrote this. When did you write um, I started it about, I guess, eight years ago now. It was actually, I, I was writing it actually I, after I had the surgery for my stenosis that mm -hmm. cleared it right up and saved my life. It's wow. the most wonderful thing in the world. Thank you, Dr. On. That was uh, amazing. But I started writing it. Yeah, it, it took me about two years to write this play because uh, I kept breaking down when I was writing it. It's still, it's still not a play I can see easily. It's not a play I can watch. It's, um, it's, it's very close to me for many reasons. It has a, a hugely emotional effect on me. But eight years ago, and I, and I completed it you know, five years ago when we opened it in Edmonton, and then I did one more rewrite after that. Because just this, just a year, well, not even a year ago, we had the laws changed yes. here. And someone very close to me has chosen to do that. And it's, we're not culturally at the place where we can actually know that on Monday at 11 o'clock someone who's very important to you is gone. And yet the courage and the, the nobility in a way mm -hmm. to be able to make that choice now is really quite extraordinary. Oh, absolutely. And uh, so does this affect the way your play functions or just this new Well, it's reality? interesting because, you know, when, when I started writing the play, this was all very much in the zeitgeist, the idea mm -hmm. of euthanasia and assisted suicide and who has the right to do it and, and who's allowed to do it and that kind of thing. And that's something, I, as I said, you know, this was going on in the 80s a great deal, in the 90s a great deal in the community I come from. We got very used to dealing with sickness and death very quickly and not at a very young age. I mean, I was 22, 23 when the, you know, the AIDS epidemic started and it's informed my entire adult life. So uh, to answer your question, I think I was probably clued into it long before mm -hmm. The rest of um, the straight world was sort of uh, into it, if you will. It's a cultural thing. We have to now make that shift. Yeah, it's our fear of death. It's yeah. our fear of dealing with any of anything to do to do with death, you know, and, and how horrible it is, and how we don't want to look at it. And I think we do have to look at it. And I think that it is another step in the journey of this life. And whether it's the final step or whether it's the beginning of something else, I don't know. But uh, because I don't know, I, I like to believe that everything that's going on right now is the important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the, I think in the, I mean, in the play, it's, it's a very complex situation because they are not following the kinds of legal protocols that one still needs to follow, even though it's been officially legalized. You, do, you have to go through very particular protocols and there are other issues involved, life insurance, and you know who gets to pull the plug, and yeah. where does it happen, and um, and uh, you know you can, you, it's really the tip of the iceberg of this kind of situation, but I, I think it's really beautifully handled. Well, it, it, it's so scary because it's like an iceberg, as you said. You know, there's this little bit we call assisted death, <laughs> and then there's all this other stuff underneath it. The way, the way society treats death, the way we deal with sickness, the way we are willing to look at and let go of people we love. Yeah. I mean, what more loving thing can one do than to help someone out of this world because they have to go? Yeah. You know, that, that's for me the, mo the, the greatest test of love yeah. that can exist. I think you have to be really careful not to conflate euthanasia with assisted suicide, right? Yes. So when the decision is made by the individual for themselves versus a decision made for right. somebody else, and we did a production yes, of Whose Life Is It Anyway a few years ago, right. and we hosted you know, debates between the BC Euthanasia Prevention Coalition and uh, the Farewell, the, the Right to Die you know, Society. Um, uh, so, and and the, the disability community, there were members of which felt that it was... Um, it, they were very upset by our production because they do feel that the decision is very frequently made for mm -hmm. the individual who lives with a disability. And uh, the playwright, Brian Clark, felt very much that this was about an individual's right to choose. But, but it, there, we see that conflation a lot. I just want to mention one, one other thing, and I, uh, love, I love the play. I'm very excited to see the production. And um, with regard to... Uh, casting anyone and everybody's you know right to access their own imagination and produce whatever work um, what, whatever work uh, is meaningful right I run a theater company with a mandate around disability mm -hmm. and it, 
create and produce performances <coughs> to deepen understanding of the disability experience. And uh, we're constantly negotiating that challenge between making the very best artistic decisions and the decisions that we need to make as a, you know, in, in, uh, with a sense of responsibility to the community. So I think there are, it's, it's, it's different when, when Roy at Patchstone is doing a production Right? and can, has the freedom to, you know, to cast and make those artistic decisions versus a company like Real Wheels mm -hmm. where uh, we, there's an onus upon us to address the gap in representation yeah. for people who live with Absolutely. disabilities given that it's more than 16% of Canadians self-identify as living with a disability. We don't see anywhere close to that representation on our stages. Right. So I just wanted, wanted to, to make that point that companies with different mandates have those limitations that are self-imposed, that are self-imposed, yeah. but that are around addressing those gaps that exist. In yeah, and that's a very good point, and I'm glad you made it. That's absolutely <clears throat> true. And it is, I mean, context is everything. And I think that's a problem <coughs> we fall into in these kind of discussions and yeah. things, is people don't want to look at the individual context of the company, of the performer, of the writer, of the situation, whatever it is. And I think that that's where we get into trouble, that when we start eliminating context and we say this word is wrong no matter what context you use it in I can tell you as a playwright who's used some of the rudest words you will ever hear in your life context is everything and if the context is right it will work if the context is not right it, it won't work. I just just to add um, one of the things that uh, Real Wheels did was the production of Creeps, which was yep. the first production that actually had disabled actors playing those roles, I believe. The first, I, I, yeah. yeah, it was the first fully integrated yeah. production. And in nice. casting Adam, I had the confidence that he already, he, it's not like playing Hamlet seven times, but the fact that he went through the process of having to address playing a character in Creeps that was, again, much more severely disabled. And we, we and I had a really great conversation about, about that was a, a challenge. And, Adam, the actor, talked about it as well. You know, it's it's it, he's he's a real proactive sort of fellow, and having to having to play much more disabled than he is was a challenge. But he embraced it because he kind of already worked through that by going through the process of creeps. So, and I don't know if I hadn't found Adam, I think I don't know that we'd be sitting here tonight. I really did feel that was important to me to try to. In, in the climate that we're in, I, w I, I was uh, a, a little concerned about doing this play without having an actor with a disability. So even though he's 35 and has a bald spot, and he's playing 17, <laughs> that's the <end. laughs> We cover that. We cover his bald spot up. And, and, and he's a beautiful bald spot. Well, well, and the other, you know, the he's other a thing. fantastic actor. And, He's not a great driver, did I mention that? <laughs> but, uh, but he's great, right? Like, I mean, he's totally like, it's been fantastic too. And he's brought so much into the room because he does come from that community as well. And so when we're talking about speculation of it, he's, he's got all of the information. He has, he has friends that are, of course, much more disabled than he is, but he's also, you know, taught literature in London, England, and uh, wrote a play about getting stuck on a uh, subway stop. A, a solo play that he's done. So we were re really lucky, but I, yeah. I do feel like that, that is context. That was the context. That it's, it's context. And it's also, um, and we see this with any kind of uh, minoritarian group that has been systematically kept out of the theater or any group or anything else where the thing is you get better if you're allowed to do it. We all get better if we're allowed to do it. And you can't judge people on their first time out the same way you can judge people who work 15 jobs a year. Right? I mean, it really is contextual, and it really is about uh, sharing, as you said, our, our experiences back and forth so we have a full understanding, or as full as we can possibly have, of what the other person, where they're coming from, and what they're doing. You had a question. I did. <laughs> Some of it's been covered, I think, but I'll come at it anyway. Um, so I came to British Columbia in 1974 from the States, and two of the first plays I saw were Hosanna and Creeps, I think. And they, for me, kind of defined Canadian theater for me, distinctive from anything I'd seen before. Uh, when I came out of either one of those plays, I kind of looked at the world a little differently than I did when I went in. And I had the privilege of seeing this yesterday, and it did the same thing. Uh, the first person I saw in a wheelchair was, you know, different to me than that person would have been had I not just seen your play. Right. 
So I think that um, that's an enlightenment. What I was going to ask as a question was, um, did creeps have any influence? Yes, creeps had a huge influence on me, and uh, did Hosanna, as did mm -hmm. Le Bel Sur, which I assistant for uh, assistant directed for Stephen Heatley in nineteen something, <laughs> <laughs> long time ago. Uh, yes, and you know that's why when when Remains opened and everybody was so, oh my God, what, oh my God, man, it was like, have you never seen Creeps? Have you never seen Hosanna? Have you never seen Equus? Have you never seen the changing? I mean. I didn't invent this shit. Like, I'm not the first person to have naked people on stage or people having sex or whatever. Do you, do you have no context for where I'm coming from? I mean, the scary thing for me now is I find theaters are, I don't think, uh, for example, um, Unidentified Human Remains and True Nature of Love would be produced today if it was a new play. I think it, it, it breaks too many rules, and I don't think the theater overall is really brave enough anymore in that same way. I mean, I was very lucky. I had Jerry Potter, who, who ran Workshop West at the time, who has no context for me at all. Like, Jerry and I couldn't be different people. I mean, it just is impossible to find two more different people. But he was willing to say, I believe democracy says everybody gets a turn. And if somebody has talent, they get to come forward. And even if I don't understand it, if I think it's going to work, I have to give them a chance. And I don't think that would happen anymore. In fact, I, I've been told, you know, five at 50, uh, there have been a number of people sort of jockeying for a production of it in Toronto. And the answer has been very simple. We're never going to do that play because Brad Fraser wrote it. It has nothing to do with the quality of the play. It has nothing to do with what the play is about. It says, what right does a gay 58-year-old man have to write a play about five 50-year-old women when there are so many women out there who could be writing the play? Well, first of all, they didn't. <laughs> Second of all, I, I picked up a, a, a script by a female playwright uh, around the same time I was writing it that had 11 men in it and took place on a pirate ship. <laughs> but, you know, my whole career has been about doing the things other people aren't doing. And for me, I still think my bravest political act in the history of my career is daring to write a play about five 50-year-old women. <laughs> you know, and not just because I know many women and, and I've had very uh, wonderful relationships and friendships with women throughout my life, but I also reached out to women on social media and said, you know, what drugs are you taking? Why are you taking them? What are they for? How do you feel about that? You know, what kind of, how do you feel about, like, is sex the same for you at 50? And all these women sent me all, it was like, oh my God, don't open that. Because <laughs> you'll never get out of here. But, but people will not produce the play because I'm the person who wrote it. You know, and I think that's, that's, that's horrifying. Go ahead. Um, I, so I have to contextualize myself. I'm a young playwright under 30 in mm -hmm. this world of who can say what. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering if there's ever a moment uh, that you've experienced in a theater where you've had to eat your words in the sense that you saw that the experience that you knew intimately that you were not happy with the way it was represented and you what do you think were the conditions for that? Or maybe like every play with a gay character uh, or right. book or movie written before I wrote one. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. There were there were other people in there. But I mean, that's the thing, you know, when people start about talk about, you know, racism and, and the treatment of women and, you know, in, so, in popular media and stuff and who has the right and who should be doing it and who shouldn't. It's like, I'm a fucking gay man. Like, you were killing us until, you know, 80 years ago with, with impunity and... I understand. Like, I understand. I, I looked like a big white guy. I didn't always look like a big white guy. I looked like a littler, what is that guy's nationality kind of guy for a big part of my life. I didn't become a big white guy until I was in my mid-20s to late 30s, and I always thought, yeah, this is a lot of privilege. People, you know, people really do anything, so am I going to use this for good or evil? <laughs> And I ultimately decided, you know, you, you do, you have to use it for good. That if you are granted privilege, whether that's privilege of, of money at birth, or whether it's the color of your skin, or whether it's an, an incredible beauty that anyone else doesn't have, or whatever it is, those are, are gifts that are meant to be used to open doors for other people. You know, Harriet Beecher Stowe is known as the woman who started the Civil War when she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, she's a white woman who was writing about people who couldn't write who were not allowed to learn to read. And in doing that, 
she opened doors for other people. Patricia Nell Warren, who wrote The Front Runner, wrote one of the, the, basically the first gay novel that had mainstream appeal that was picked up by Hollywood and stuff. Now, she's a white woman, and it was actually, uh, she's a friend of mine on Facebook, which is quite wonderful, but she, uh, she was straight at the time, but came out as a lesbian after she wrote the book. Again, she opened the door for me because she was a privileged white woman who was willing to talk about love between men in a non-sensationalistic way. So the, the, you know, the point of privilege, the point of the majority, the point of people who have the power to do things other people don't have the power to do, you have an obligation to use that power to help those people do that, to open those doors. And then once those doors are open, to stop, step back and say, okay, I'm not gonna do that anymore, I'm gonna go on to something else. Have a field day, Gloria, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Brad, I'd like to thank you for saying that no one has the right to control your imagination. And I'd like to add to that. So, I mean, a person would like to think that an artist or a writer like you or an actor or any artist is capable also of empathy. Um, so, uh, you know, they might not be this or that or the next thing, but they must be capable of kind of some kind of empathy with people who are different than they are. And in, in my opinion, I'm kind of on a soapbox here, empathy is probably the biggest crisis that we have in our society. Today. Absolutely. And so, Building empathy, I mean, there are many good ways to do that, but I can't think of a better place to do that than in the theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. And so, you know, I'd like to thank you for your courage um, for doing that, because what's at stake is nothing less than the survival of our um, society. Yeah, and, and you're on the democracy. front line. Yeah. And yeah. thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I have no choice. I have no choice. I, I cannot be anyone that, other than I am. I mean, I, I really, it's not like I'm going, I'm going to, it's like, no, this is who I am. And, and, and one of the great things that I've gotten, it's only gotten better as I've gotten older, I don't give a fuck what other people think. Yeah. I, I rarely ever have. Most of them are full of shit anyway. So, you know, get mad, call me whatever you want to, attack me on Facebook, you know, attack me on Twitter, I get a lot of death threats, oh, I love that shit, man. <laughs> it lets me know I'm doing something important. Well, please also know that other people think it's important and appreciate it. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. When you're creating these um, out there characters, these risky characters, and you obviously are showing that you're doing the research, you're asking the community what uh, these, these people, these regular people are going through, when you create these characters, do you end up basing them on a person, or do you end up basing them on the environment they live in? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. I, I, I do all of those things. Often they're a, a, a kernel of someone I know, you know, is where I start, because it, it's very immediate, and if you know the person, then, you know, you have that much more connection to them, and then it, it sort of grows out from there, and it's looking for other people like that to find the differences and that kind of thing. I mean, I spend a lot of time listening to how people speak, to listening to what words they choose, what their syntax is like, what the rhythm of their speech is, of, of recognizing that, and for me, as a, as a playwright, as a dramatist, that's my way into the characters, is what are they saying, and how are they saying it, and how is it different, you know, we may all be in the theater, but we don't all necessarily express ourselves the same way, and yet we have commonalities in the way we express ourselves that say we're in, we're a group, but also say we're individuals as well. So for me, it always starts usually with the language and the way people speak, and then kind of, uh, kind of moving up from there. Thank you if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Brad, you talked earlier about breaking rules. You said, I think you intimated maybe not to break rules. Do you know when you're breaking rules? Do you do it sometimes deliberately or just you come along something, I, I've done this and I don't think I'm really supposed to do that. Is there, a, is there a demarcation line for you about breaking rules or not breaking rules? I, I, I want to break rules. That, that's my objective. I mean, that was the story about working with Urjo and, and saying, okay, those are the rules of Canadian theater. Now I'm going to do the exact opposite uh, and see what happens. Because rules, rules sometimes have really good uh, reasons for being there. And certainly, I, I, one of the things I really 
uh, cherish in my training is the technical end of theater that I learned in the high school for the performing arts. The difference between an upstage and a downstage turn. The difference between gesturing with your downstage or your upstage arm. Being able to uh, speak clearly and loud enough to fill an entire house and know that you have the support to do that. To be able to tell a, a story with your body as important is as important as being able to tell it with your voice. I mean, I, I think there are good reasons for rules. And, and then there are also good reasons for throwing those rules out the window from time to time and seeing what happens with them. Um, and I'm a little disturbed right now that people aren't getting that kind of technical training anymore. Mm -hmm. That it all seems to be this kind of, anybody can be a writer, anybody can be an actor, you just have to be it. It's like, yeah, no, no, that's not how this works. Talent is not distributed evenly and democratically as much as we would like it to be. And, and determination, determination is even less distributed uh, democratically than, than talent is, and the ability to, to um, uh, fight for what you want, to, to go out there and pursue and not take no for an answer, to, to seduce people or bully people or wheedle people, whatever you have to do to get it done, those things are not distributed democratically. Everybody has a different way of doing it. So the desire to be an artist and the actual being an artist are, and a working artist are very, very different things. And you know, I think we have to keep that in mind. And because theater as, as therapy, I'm a big believer in theater as therapy and I've done it with, uh, with you know, various groups of people uh, as a way of expressing themselves, as a way of bringing them out of uh, a shell that they're in or whatever, that's great. I love that, but I'm not fucking paying for it. I'm not going to pay money to go watch someone do that. I'm going to go watch professionals make theater, and then I'll give you my money. They're different things. And sometimes they do intersect, and they absolutely can intersect. And shouldn't sometimes very exciting things come out of that intersection. But overall, you know, theater for therapy is mostly theater for therapy. <laughs> When you are working with a director or a dramaturge, um, what sort of qualities are you looking for in that relationship when developing your plays? That changes, right? I mean, as a young uh, uh, writer, I was really looking for um, dramaturges and directors who could help me understand and unlock what I was trying to do, and I didn't have very much success with that. Mm -hmm. um, because there weren't a lot of people who were dealing with, you know, queer teenagers from the wrong side of the tracks in the theater in, in the 70s. They just, they're just weren't. Um, but as I've gotten older, and, and um, I foster relationships. I mean, Iris Turcotte, who died two years ago in Toronto, who I've worked with on every play from Superman up, uh, this being the last, no, this not being the last, yeah, this is the last play that we worked on together, actually. Um, I was had an understanding of what I was trying to do so that she could tell me if I was doing it or not. Uh -huh. And that's, that's very important. And she was not always respectful about it, but it didn't really matter because often she was right. And when she wasn't right, I'd just say, fuck off, you're wrong. And she'd say, no, I'm not, we'll find out when it opens. <laughs> you know? Um, Graham Murray at the, at the Royal Exchange, who sadly died in August as well because everybody I love and work with is dying now. Um, you know, he came to me in, in 1998 when Martin Yesterday had just opened in Toronto and gotten me the worst reviews of my career uh, and said, oh, fuck them, they're, they're, you know, they're off you right now. Come to Manchester, I'll produce anything you do. And we, we worked that way. And he's a very old school kind of director. He's very, okay, you go there, you go there, you go there, pick the dish up, do that. I mean, that's sort of his direction, but he believed in the work enough that he knew he would bring something to it, and what he didn't bring to it, I could come into rehearsal and say, yeah, no, Bram, that's not what's supposed to be going on there. Try something else. I mean, it's about how people mesh. It's, it, you know, it's that, uh, that way we work together, and some people it happens wonderfully with, and some people it, it doesn't happen at all. You know, as a general rule of thumb, if you're working with a, a dramaturge, and you feel like they're trying to get you to write the play they want you to write, mm -hmm. run away as yeah. fast as you possibly can. And tell other people to run away yeah. as well, because we have a lot of dramaturges like that in this country, and they do a great deal of damage to young writers in particular. And I think that you, know, you have an obligation, and, and again, I work with young writers, I work with students, to 
find out who they are and what they're trying to do and what's unique in what they're trying to do and how you can help bring that out rather than try to sort of redirect it to this is the way we write plays and, and you should do it like this. Does that answer your question? Totally, yeah. Mm -hmm. Be wary of dramaturges. <laughs> <laughs> they ruin a lot of good plays. Yeah. Potentially um, good plays. We're coming, we're coming to near to the end of this, uh, of this event. There's a bar out there. There are copies of the play, which um, I'm sure for a small fee, Brad would kindly, you know, uh, Sign, um, but uh, <laughs> oh, I wish that were true. <laughs> I'd love to be one of those people at the Comic Con who sit at the thing and yeah. everyone pays you twenty dollars to have you autograph your still from Star Trek in nineteen sixty-two, <laughs> like, the third red shirt who got killed or whatever. I would love to do that. They get garbage bags full of money, those guys. <laughs> I, I, I actually have two things that I, I want to say. First of all, I think Erto Carreta would like this play very much and approve of the structure. I think this is very much a realist drama that follows pretty much all the rules of <laughs> realist drama. There's no monologue at the end that brings it all together. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's nice, everything that <laughs> but other than that, yeah, totally. Uh, and it's also going to be really hard to get those dead trees on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> cows, what about the cows? Well, Tarragon has killed more fucking trees than <laughs> a pulp mill in BC ever had. You know how many dead trees they put on the stage over the last 40 years? All of them. <laughs> um, the, the other thing I want to to say, and, and it actually goes back to the, the Creeps um, production that Real Wheels did. One of the things I think uh, you very smart about in your introduction to the play is you say that disability uh, exists on a very broad spectrum. spectrum. That yeah. dis there isn't just a, you know, if you've got a disabled character, you've got to get a disabled actor. Um, and as Roy pointed out, it's, it's actually hard to find, and especially the peculiar kind of disability that Joey suffers from in this mm -hmm. play, which, did you make it up? No, I, no, I actually, I know exactly what it is, and I, I know a number of people who have it, okay. but I don't want to name it. I don't want to pin it down. Right. I, mean, I, I think that, you know, it's a bit like The Answering Machine and Human Remains was a really great theatrical conceit in 1989. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck do you do with it now? Yeah. Things change, things grow, things, yeah, we find cures for things all the time, you know, yeah. that they do change. So I, I have learned to be a little less specific at times right. with some of that stuff. But I think that for me, the great thing about that production of Creeps was that it did integrate actors with disability and, and whatever, abled actors. Yeah, and at the end of the show, you didn't know which actor was disabled and which wasn't. And Who most wasn't. of us are somewhere along the spectrum. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and, I, and this is a play, I think, that, that Creeps is very much a play about how the abled world is as disabled in its you know, various ways. And this is also a play about people who don't necessarily <laughs> suffer from obvious you know, vis visual or physical kinds of disability but who are as messed up. Or oh, more every messed actor up. is disabled. Every artist is disabled <laughs> in some way. Everybody has a challenge. Usually, I mean, we a never challenge. talk about mental disability mm -hmm. in the arts, you know, and, and, or a how, disability. and how that may be what drives us to actually do what we do. I mean, physical disability is easy to pick out because it's visible, right. but the less visible disabilities that we all carry, I mean, isn't that where empathy comes from quite often? Isn't that where we find those points of connection and understanding? I mean, we may be physically able, but that doesn't mean we are abled people. Yeah. 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 Brad Fraser. <laughs>